Hi, it's me again, Evan, and I'm here to bring you another interview. Thank you so much for all the words of encouragement for the previous interview with Ronald. Uh, it, came from, it came from all kinds of uh, different social media platforms all over, even in the email. Thank you so much and hope you like this one as well. And in this video, we have Jason as our interviewee today. Thank you for accepting the interview. You're welcome. Dr. Jason Koo is currently a senior lecturer in the Department of Mechanical Engineering in National University of Singapore. He has his bachelor, master's and PhD in Mechanical Engineering from the Massachusetts Inter Institute of Technology in 2009, 2011 and 2016 respectively. He has been a postdoc researcher and lecturer in the MIT Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. He has a passion for simplifying difficult but useful concepts. His research specializes in the computational design of transformable folding structures with multidisciplinary applications. And I must say, preparing for your interview is pretty tough. <laughs> I watched one of your, your videos on this uh, artistic uh, origami design, mm -hmm. on this uh, geometric folding algorithms on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Then the suggestion pane column was filled with all your materials. <laughs> so I didn't got to um, uh, finish watching them, but uh, I, I did uh, read quite a lot of your papers mm -hmm. when I was um, going through all your materials all your, from all your websites. Mm -hmm. A total of uh, 44 papers. <laughs> <laughs> Although I don't have the training to fully understand the majority of it, sure. I did un uh, enjoy the maze papers and also the Pachinko papers. Okay, firstly, we have a question from Ivan. He observed that people think 22.5 design is hard, in your opinion, how could one easily master 22.5 design? So 22.5 uh, degree design is, I think, understandably harder than something like uh, box pleating design mm -hmm. and things like that, things where there's a lot of theory behind them. The difficulty with 22.5 uh, degree uh, folding is that the distances involved are inherently uh, irrational, right? So. Uh, it involves a lot of uh, distances related to the root of two, which is a irrational number. And because of that, uh, it's not as easy to kind of tile things or extend things in the easy, rational way that uh, box pleating enables. So uh, how can one easily master 22.5 degree design? I'm not sure one can easily master it, but uh, certainly the place where uh, I, I wouldn't consider myself a 22.5 degree design expert uh, by any means, but um, if you're interested in learning about 22.5 degree design, it's not like there's a book like ODS that you can go and, and look up just concentrating on 22.5 degree design, but there are a lot of crease patterns from 22.5 degree design masters out there. Finding those crease patterns and folding them, analyzing them yourself, studying them, that's really how I started to design my own origami was to, of course, get my skills up in, uh, in being able to fold from diagrams, then being able to fold and understand and analyze crease patterns, and that uh, study was what helped me as a designer the most because I could kind of start to see the correspondence between a crease pattern and a folded object. So uh, what models do you uh, employ in 2.5 design? Most of my models are not pure box pleating. Most of them have some other angles like Pythagorean stretches or 22.5 degree, but it's not in the same as, as someone like Matsu or Mayakawa or, or Marisoe, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? They, they are uh, the 22.5 degree angles or obelisk, right? right. 22.5 degree angles extend throughout their models. Some of the models that I've designed that make, I, I, in preparing for this question, I, I looked back on some of my models and realized yes. that I'm not really <laughs> such a 22.5 degree uh, designer. But you can see it in stuff like uh, I have a pteranodon, a flying um, dinosaur that uses 22.5 degree. My, my Nazgul model, the Black Rider from The Lord of the Rings, uses a lot of 22.5 degree stuff. But most of the 22.5 degree stuff in my kind of repertoire is uh, the, the 
the bulk of the materials are using kind of a coarse box pleating with at a, at a hopefully a kind of a low resolution and then the 22.5 degrees allows some smaller flaps to come in but also to, to thin places that need thinning, that kind of thing. So what goes on in your mind when you are trying to deploy 22.5 degree? Uh, that's a little hard to answer and without uh, context of a particular model that I'm, I'm designing. Um, but what, what goes on in my mind? Generally, the way in which I design a model is not to say, I'm going to design this as box pleating or I'm going to design this as 22.5 degree or something like that. I'm going to say I want to make this subject and the first thing I do when I'm trying to design a subject is to get a rough idea of a tree associated with that model, right? Uh, and not necessarily that I'm using tree theory precisely like the way that it's laid out in ODS, but every origami model is constrained in the some of the fundamental concepts behind tree theory in that paper can only exist in one place of your model at a time and there are distance constraints if you have a point on your sheet of paper over here and a point of your sheet of paper over here on the model then the distance on the paper has to be at least that large right and so those uh, kinds of conditions and those kinds of constraints are easier to kind of understand if you have a rough idea of what the shape of your model is and a tree is a good way of modeling that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the next step is to kind of roughly lay that out on a sheet of paper to make sure those distance constraints, those inequalities are satisfied. And usually that process, you could use something like TreeMaker or something like that to to do that process for you. And one of the things that a lot of designers, uh, me included, get caught up in when they're designing things using tree theory is that for me, if a flap is ends up being a little smaller, or a little bigger okay. than what I originally planned out for, a little bigger is actually okay, right? Because I can always Shrink it. Short, shorten yeah. it or round it or you know do something to make it a little smaller and so when I'm designing a base uh, I'm usually trying to get the simplest arrangement of creases that will yield something with that tree like shape uh, sometimes at the expense of adjusting the proportions of the original tree so that I can simplify the folding structure and so even if I get a little bit less efficiency in kind of the use of paper, uh, I try to optimize for my efficiency as a designer, mm -hmm. the economy of creases, the, the amount I have to fold and pre-crease myself, <laughs> right? Because these days, I mean, when I was starting out designing, I wanted to make the most complicated things that I could figure out how to make. And of course, people do much more complicated things now. These days, when I design an origami model, I still oftentimes will try to tackle a complex subject. But the challenge for me is to represent that complex subject with an economy of folds, with the fewest brush strokes that I can, so that, because I'm also lazy, I, I don't have efficiency to, of the step, right? efficiency yeah. of my time, because I don't have a lot of time to fold anymore. Yeah, I'm curious, how do you choose Singapore as a work destination? Right, so right before the COVID pandemic, I was uh, teaching in the computer science department at MIT and uh, was living there with my wife. We were there for three years, or she was living with me there for three years, uh, but it was, it was pretty difficult on her. She was, uh, she's a Korean national, uh, and the move from Korea to Boston was uh, a bit of a culture shock, and also the weather was, uh, you know, she really doesn't like the cold winters. Uh, of Boston and it being snowy and kind of gross most of the time. Uh, I lo love the winter, but um, I think it was it was difficult on her. And so uh, around 2019 or so, uh, we were looking for places that were closer to home for her uh, in this part of the world, uh, as well as a place that's not so cold all the time. And uh, Singapore fits that bill perfectly. And so uh, we decided to to come here. Uh, we were supposed to move here in June of 2020, 
but that was right in the middle of Circuit Breaker, and uh, and they wouldn't let anyone into the country. So we didn't quite get in until the till later in 2020. But we've been here now for about three years and uh, really enjoying it. Uh, she really likes the, the weather here. Uh, it's a little hot for me. Uh, yeah, but, right. We just paused the video. <laughs> <fresh enough. laughs> but luckily, my mood isn't so affected by by a change in temperature. I can be inside most of the time in the air conditioner, and that's that's fine with me. Yeah. How are you getting used to the food? Yeah, here? food and weather. We mm. Weather. Uh, you know, I go on some of these long walks in Singapore mm. sometimes. Uh, not not during the middle of the day, but uh, you know, <laughs> in, the, in the evening or the morning. Yes. My wife and I have been going on two or three hour long walks mm. up Bukatima Hill and up Mount Faber, and you know, down downtown and things like that. Getting used to being outside in the heat uh, is is one thing. Uh, the food is great. The food in like near MIT when I was there, it was just, you know, pretty bad and quite expensive. Oh dear. <laughs> Here you can get very good cheap, very good food for quite cheap, uh, as well as spend a lot of money and get good food, but pretty much all of it's good food, so we're enjoying it here a lot. Nice, good to hear. What's, what's your favorite food? Just local food? In, uh, what's my favorite? Of course, I like chicken rice, so I go to the NUS canteen at least once a week and get from the chicken rice stall. Uh, usually chicken noodle, roast, roast chicken noodle, set meal. Surprisingly, they have some very good Korean barbecue here in Singapore. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, and we, we've been able to find some places that give places in Seoul a run for their money. So that's very good. A place called Pepper Lunch. I don't know if you know yeah, that. Yeah, I love Pepper good. Lunch. Very cheap, but you know, quite tasty. So. Mm-hmm. All sorts of food in, in Singapore is great. Did you aspire to be an academic? You are now since your youth. Yes, I grew up, my uh, mom was a painter and an artist, uh, and my dad was a professor, mm-hmm. a professor in mechanical engineering and biomedical engineering in the wow. business department. He was working to be a cardiac surgeon for a while in, in his residency, but uh, felt that surgery life was not for him, and so he went into academia uh, in, in mechanical and biomedical engineering departments and uh, so I grew up in a very academic household. Uh, I admired uh, my father as well as my mother uh, and one of the things that I liked about origami was that it combined kind of that engineering side with the artistic yes. side. It was a very nice blend of the two and I felt that was that was fortuitous in terms of my upbringing. Uh, but I really, I, I always loved school when I was growing up. I liked academics, and so I was pretty sure that this is the direction I wanted to go. Oh, nice. So it's like your, your dad has this um, the, the, the professor side of things, and then mm-hmm. your mom has the artistic side of things, mm-hmm. then blend together to make you... <laughs> Trying to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah your, your interests. Exactly. Okay. So how was your childhood like? It was fun. I, I enjoyed my childhood. Uh, my, my family, my parents didn't come from a lot of money or anything and they were they liked education and so we were encouraged most of the time to to read books a lot of encouragement from my mom was we didn't get a lot of toys we might get one special toy on christmas or our birthday or something like that but we were encouraged to make our own toys mm-hmm. right and okay. uh, you know draw or create things or do things right that, those kinds of things instead of absorbing things from around us or needing to purchase things, we learned to create our, our own entertainment, I guess. And origami was a big part of that for me. First got my an origami book at a children's museum in Portland, Maine. I think that was my first origami book. But uh, I, I had exposure to origami from my grandparents, from my mom, from a pretty young age. But I didn't take it seriously until I got what I might call a real origami book. That was one of uh, John Montrell's books. Yeah, it was like a similar um, um, experience, you know, you make toys for yourself. Right? Sure, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I understand that you are um, half Chinese in your ethnicity. Yes. Are you able to speak any Chinese? I Not really, no, no, not at all. Uh, Did you learn? Uh, not really. Uh, my, I am what you might call a third generation uh, American. My grandparents moved to U.S. from China in the, I don't know, I want to say the 40s or something like that. Mm-hmm. When they had kids, they really wanted to integrate into American society and learn English. And so they really encouraged their children, my dad in particular, 
to speak back to them in English, even though they could understand Chinese, they really couldn't speak it very well because their parents wanted to learn English. And so when it got to me, <laughs> my my dad, my my dad's Chinese, my my mom's a generic white person from from the U.S. They never really talked to us in Chinese, <laughs> but I would see my grandparents most weekends, and I would hear them speaking <laughs> Chinese, okay. but. I wasn't interacting with them. I wasn't trying to understand. the The most Chinese I know is probably we would sometimes play mahjong with them.、Mm-hmm. And so, so I, you know I learned some. Yeah, I know how to play mahjong. I I learned some of the words associated with the game. Though I, it's not clear that I actually know what those <laughs> words are. It's kind of like I know these sounds that my grandparents used to make. So, so like like pong pong yes or hu 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 la hu la. Yeah, <laughs> nice. So I believe you must have been, you know, a pretty good student in school.、Um, mm-hmm. And origami takes up a lot of time. How do you juggle that? Yeah, so I was lucky to be pretty good at school and not not need to spend a lot of time on my my schoolwork. And I had teachers who were pretty、uh, patient with the fact that、uh, usually I was fine to pay attention in class. Even if I was folding something, so a lot of times if I had a new teacher for the start of the year, you know, I might ask them.、Uh, I'm paying attention. You can ask me questions, but do you mind if I fiddle with something in my hand and, and things like that? And,、okay. and they were. I was lucky in that they were usually pretty accommodating with that, as long as it wasn't distracting to other students. Some teachers were not, and I pay attention and not fold, but.、Um, I like to fold, and that was that was a fun way to do that. And I, it was actually something that, for whatever reason, might, helped me to concentrate a little bit more on that material because usually they weren't going at a pace that was too fast for me in the first place. So it's like、uh, I could I could focus on that、uh, while still doing something else. So it's like the the teacher is teaching something.、Mm-hmm. You have a textbook and an origami book. No, not not not.、Uh, sometimes, sometimes I might have an origami book, but sometimes it would just be folding something. Free folding. I, I had known exploration. Like, not not. Th- I didn't do a lot of free folding, but I did memorize a lot of models when I was young.、Mm. Repeatedly fold them. I liked Chazelle's rat a lot. Robert Neal's dragon. John Montral、uh, models. I folded a lot and could do by heart. Some some of the insects from Robert Lang's origami insects and their kin. I I learned by heart, though I probably don't know now. <laughs> But it, I'm trying to remember the folding sequences for some of these things was a challenge, and so I enjoyed that challenge of trying to remember. Those those folding steps, but crease patterns were very foreign to me at the time. So it, I was really beholden to the sequences. I, these days, I'm really glad that people who are starting origami have exposure to a lot of different ways of understanding an origami model. Certainly, would have been useful、uh, when I was younger, but I think I know a lot of those things now better because I had to discover them. So. Yeah. So especially when we are about the same、mm-hmm. like age group, right? We are all like millennials, and <laughs> and、um, how we start origami or design is、uh-huh. like pretty similar, right?、Uh-huh. Yeah, we memorize the, the the steps and all that. So、sure. how do you start designing origami? Yeah. So that was tough. Designing origami seemed very daunting to me when I was maybe in middle school. I was at the level where I could fold anything in. In books that I could get, I got some origami house books. What some of the first ones like Origami Fantasy by、uh, by Kawahata and things like that. Some some the the most complex origami diagrams that I could find, one could find at the time, and I could get through those no problem. But it was always frustrating for me. Why can't I design things yes, yes. like that? And I would always try and just. Well, I wouldn't try. That was the problem, right? I wouldn't even try because I didn't know where to start. Yes. yes. And so, probably the best advice I got from for designing was、uh, when I was in middle school. I started going to the Origami USA conventions in New York, and I got to meet a lot of the people that were writing the origami books that I had. I got to meet John Montrell. I got to meet Robert Lang. I got to meet. Okay, no, she's ever all right. <laughs>、uh, that was at a. Conference in Charlotte, North Carolina, a、mm. southeastern origami festival or something like that, organized by Jonathan Baxter. At that conference, I got to meet 
Akira Yoshizawa, I got to meet Eric Schwazel, I got to meet a lot of people that are big yeah. now that unfortunately people don't get to meet now. But at the, at the first Origami USA conferences that I went to, I went up to these people that I idolized and was like, how do you design? And I think probably John Montrell just said, I don't, I don't know, I just told and it happens. And, and that was a little frustrating uh, <laughs> for me. Uh, but most of the designers that I talked to told me that you just try it. Just don't be afraid to try and fail. And this is something that I tell my students now these days, right? Almost all the time when you start something new, you're going to fail the first time. So that's okay. Just get those first couple of times out of the way, fail, don't feel bad about it, and just try again. And you'll get better and better over time. And so I think that summer after that New York convention, I just tried it. And if you look on the website, the first yes. year or yeah. so was not very good origami models. That's but I was trying. Yeah, yeah and I was, the, the thing is, the hardest part for me was finding a subject to design. Right? Yes. Some people have no problem with that at all. Like, you know, look at Jeremy Schaefer models or you know, Brian Chan models. And like, it seems like they have no end of inspiration for things that they want to make. I always had that problem. I didn't know what to, to fold. And the things that I really wanted to fold, I didn't have the confidence to be able to do. So the first, I think some of the more successful models that I started to initially design were things that I didn't see anyone else folding. Right? So there was a model where you know, I'd seen this optical illusion where you, you had a, a cup pouring out water onto to a surface, but the water was made of plastic and it was holding up the cup and it was like yes, this yes, thing, right? right? And so I tried to make that out of origami. You can see that on my website. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a great model by these standards, but you know, it was something I hadn't seen before, a subject matter that was interesting to me and actually wasn't that difficult to design. Uh, and so those types of things, you know, instead of just making a bird, I wanted to see if I could make a bird sitting on a branch or sitting on a loop or something like that. And so that was one of the first origami models. I, and, and as I progressed, I'm studying crease patterns, trying to figure out how these crease patterns turn into the pictures that I see of the models on the internet and developing that intuition of that correspondence, even before I got to lay my hands on a copy of ODS, was really important to me. I, got, I, I, I developed a way of looking at a crease pattern, and even without the picture of the model in and of itself, if it was a kind of a uniaxial, now, now what I know is a uniaxial base, there was a way that I could draw lines on it to try to discover what that crease pattern was going to fold into without having to fold it. without having, And so I could study crease patterns that way. Then, of course, at one of the New York conventions, one of the times I met Robert Lang, he had this manuscript that was unpublished at the time. But I got to look at, for a couple days, a copy of Origami Design Secrets oh, nice. prior to it's it being published. Well. Now, of course, at that time, I had already looked at Tree Maker and looked at, at kind of how that program worked, couldn't, couldn't really understand it very well, but uh, yes, some same. of the stuff in that, that manuscript helped me kind of understand some of those basic ideas. That's, that was my start to origami design, but really my advice to anyone who's trying to learn how to design or do something creative, is just that you're going to be bad at first. And you can't be afraid of that. You just have to try. Your topic stuff, actually, when you talk about, um, uh -huh. you're trying to always choose the topic where uh, nobody actually talks, uh, thought of it or you know, ventured before, right? Yeah, so, because then I know it's mm -hmm. going to compare. Like, I, I did something that no one, If I tried to make an elephant, everyone yes. and their mom has made an elephant, right? And so all my mm -hmm. solution would be worse than every other <laughs> elephant out there, or most of them, right? I don't feel bad about it. So, yeah, but, but if I do something that no one has done before, yeah. it may be the worst that anyone has ever made, but it's also the best. No so the basis <laughs> of comparison, right? Exactly. Yeah. So you have things it's like, um, this, right? This, I yeah. recall, is the H... H.J. Rex. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, H.J. Rex. Kind so of modeled after the uh, Indominus Rex of, uh, of 
Jurassic, Jurassic World when it came out. And uh, yes, what, what about this model? This is one that uh, certainly many uh, people have designed. Uh, uh, dinosaurs of this. Generic Tyrannosaurus Rex. This one, when I was designing it, making the observation that the Indominus Rex of Jurassic World, usually you think of a T-Rex, they have these really short, stubby little claws. Yes. But this one had longer, longer arms with, <laughs> with claws that were quite menacing. Uh, and, and so that's more of why I want to make this one, because it, do, it doesn't have arms that are realistic to a T-Rex, but it was appropriate for that movie. So yeah, this is for the working adults. So currently okay. you are a lecturer in the NUS and also the director and chairperson of Oregon USA, helping uh, to organize events like BoFest. Mm -hmm. And thanks a lot for it, I enjoyed myself uh, <laughs> seeing the replace. How do you juggle uh, career with Oregon? Well, I want to thank you for being a volunteer for Fold Fest in the past. That's been very helpful. Everyone who's watching, please attend Fold Fest in the future if you can. It's an Oregon USA event. Um, but how do I juggle work and my pa uh, passion, which is Oregon? Uh, well, as a student, that was a, a thing that was relatively easy to juggle because as a student, I actually had a little bit more time. Uh, now that I uh, look back on it. Yes. Uh, and so <laughs> as a graduate student, for example, I put a lot of effort into probably more time I should have been spending in, in my research. I ended up spending it into growing the origami club at MIT, <laughs> holding design <laughs> workshops, organizing an annual convention, you know, doing lot, organizing paper making things, like lots of different things. It wasn't really a balance as much as I was doing more of that than I probably should have. When I got out of school, when I finally defended my PhD and started going into teaching, less time for actually designing Oregon. And if you take a look at my website, you'll see that my output in terms of origami designs has been declining. I only design <laughs> one or two models a year, if that. Uh, and usually they tend to be simpler these days because I don't have the time to put into making an exhibition quality complex model. But the things that I focus my energy in now uh, have to do with origami, but aren't necessarily designing origami models per se. I'm lucky in that a lot of the research that I do, that yes. I can consider as part of my work, I can focus on solving origami-related problems, right? Mm -hmm. uh, things like the, the software that I've been developing, things like uh, academic papers on, on the complexity of folding-related problems. Uh, those things I can class, even though I'm not designing origami, I can classify those things as work, publish papers in doing that, and I still get contact with origami. Yes. And then the other way that I still keep involved, as you said, was to volunteer my time for origami organizations, right? So Origami USA is one of them. I've been a member of that organization for a long time, and now I'm the chairman of the board. Making that board, helping that board to function well, uh, and to uh, is is a way that I can give back to that organization that has given me a lot through their conventions and through their interactions and connecting me with other people in the community. So it's less of a balance. That's these are nonprofit roles that doesn't don't take a lot of time out mm -hmm. from me. So it's it's not something that I mean anybody can serve on a you know volunteer board maybe a, a meeting once a month kind of thing uh, you have to be regular about <laughs> uh, participating in those activities but it doesn't actually take a lot a lot of time now organizing events like an you know online fold fest uh, like we've been doing that does take a little bit more time but a little bit of organization can spread that volunteer time over a longer period of time so that as long as you're planning well ahead, you can do a little bit each week and, and, and make it happen. Now that, that doesn't always go as planned, some, sometimes you have some late nights. So the thing is don't do last minute work. <laughs> yeah, that, and that's a thing that I tell my students all the time, to not do things last minute, but of course I fall into that trap sometimes yeah. as well. We all do, we all do. <laughs> Who are your biggest uh, influencers in your origami life and what lessons did you mm. learn from them? Biggest uh, influences. So certainly uh, in the U.S. when I was growing up, 
biggest influences were uh, John Montrell and Robert Lang. So John Montrell in that his books were certainly the majority of my books when I was growing up because he was one of the most prolific authors in the U.S. at that time. And so I learned a lot of the kind of basics and the terminology and things from him. Robert Lang, because the kinds of mathematics and the way of designing are something that I absorbed uh, while I was learning how to design. Probably my biggest influence influences in design were the designers that were, you know, quite prominent. Uh, people like Satoshi Kamiya, uh, Komatsu, uh, Hojo-san, um, Mayakawa-san. When I was growing up, lots of that generation of Japanese folders that had websites that designed a lot of models that published their crease patterns online. Even though I didn't get access to a lot of their diagrammed work, I could still study their models through crease patterns. Mm -hmm. And because those were the sources where I could get crease patterns while I was trying to absorb, those were the probably some of the biggest influences on me when I was learning to design complex models. Of course, mm -hmm. uh, later on in my life, uh, in 2012, I think, I took a break from my, my doctoral studies, my PhD studies, uh, right after my qualifying exams. I had been in school for a very long time. I needed a break. So uh, I actually went and lived in Japan for a year oh, and okay. worked at Origami House. Yam Yamaguchi-san, the kind of boss of Origami House at the time, uh, offered me, while I was guest at one of the Japanese conventions, to, to stay and work for a year in, in Tokyo. Uh, and he wouldn't pay me a lot, right? Uh, he would give me free room and board with, uh, actually, uh, Kamatsu-san, who's another uh, fantastic origami designer, who was another employee at Origami House at the time. I could, I could live with him in a very small room in a hundred-year-old Japanese house, and he would give me a, about $1,000 a month. And uh, the catch was I also had to spend about $600 per month on Japanese language classes. So I was trying to live in Tokyo on about $400 a month, that's, it was very difficult for me, but as a poor graduate student, I was pretty used to that kind of poor <laughs> kind of lifestyle. And so while it was one of the toughest years for me, because I was away from my family and friends in a place that I didn't know the language for, uh, doing at, at first seemed to be kind of like, I don't know, busy work, because they, they really didn't need me to be there, right? They, they, uh, they wanted me to be there and be exposed to things. But they didn't really have a lot of work to give me because I, I couldn't really help in Japanese. I learned so much while I was there. I learned some conversational Japanese. I learned about how Origami House does diagrams, the, their standards and their review process, and a structure for uh, how they make a good model, what their standards for a good model are, really the, the thought that they put into in terms of breaking down a folding sequence to make it easy to absorb. Things that, you know, most diagram, I mean, you've done some diagramming, I think. Um, a lot of people will just find any folding sequence that they can find to get to the ending result and usually try to optimize for the fewest steps that they yes. have to diagram because that's, that's the best way. But, you know, it, at Origami House, really trying to figure out the best way to convey this operation to get from one place to the other next even if it takes a few more steps or that it's kind more of thing. Um, customer experience, right? Exactly, yeah. 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 Uh, and so they want to make it as clear as they can. Mm -hmm. Always humbled that the, uh, that, that Yamaguchi son provided that opportunity for me. Uh, it wasn't the easiest situation all the time, but I must say that he influenced a lot how I moved forward in the origami world and how I give my time to origami organizations now. I've helped start up a origami club here at NUS, but also being exposed to the Japanese origami community that's, in a, in a sense, one of the most you know advanced places for origami uh, in, in the world. Getting to work with Komatsu-san and Kamiya-san every day, getting exposed to the younger generation of folders in their monthly gatherings and things like that. It was, it was an eye-opening experience for me. So uh, I, I would say that that was one of the biggest influences. So how, how do you apply to 
to do that. Yes. Uh, it's not really something you apply to. It's more like uh, if you've been around that community for a while, mm. uh, I know that there are a few other individuals that Yamaguchi san offered this opportunity for some Korean folders, some some other Japanese as interns, that kind of thing. I think Yamaguchi san is retired from that uh, day-to-day position at Origami House and Joas now, I believe. I think that's the case. And so I'm not sure if, if that opportunity is available for <laughs> for applicants, if you will. Yes. Yeah. So I'm very lucky to have had access to that yes. opportunity. Yeah. Then you can hear the story today. None of us know it. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So many folders also uh, practice other disciplines other than sure. uh, origami, like painting, photography, martial arts. Uh, uh-huh. Was it the same for you? Uh, so my mom was a painter. I drew some as a kid, uh, and I, I have sketchbooks of me trying to visualize what I want an origami model to look like. But it was mostly in pursuit of origami design. Um, I did a lot of other things as a kid. In high school, I did a lot of rock climbing. I ran cross country. Uh, those are kind of sports-related things. I liked to play chess. I was in a chess club for a little while. Uh, I sang a lot. I was in a lot of choirs and things like that. But nothing held my creative passion for me more than, than origami. Uh, so I, origami was kind of always above the other yeah. years for me. You know, very open-based question. What trend do you see over the years in terms of um, origami design? Trends in origami yeah, you design? Observed through the decades? Yeah. So origami design tends to go in waves. There was a lot of concentration, like right before I started designing on the bug wars, where you're trying to make better bugs. People were trying to one-up each other in design all the time. And then then it kind of moved to different types of techniques, like doing box pleating really well, or doing 22.5 degree uh, design very well. Now you've got things that are trying to generalize uh, box pleating and circle river packing for non-uniaxial bases. I think it's called E... R- and R- 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 right? Uh, that, that are, uh, so really neat techniques being designed. Mm-hmm. And those get popular. And, uh, but, and then we go back to things like subject, various subject materials. Uh, the way in which people design origami these days is certainly different from when I was a, a kid. When I was uh, younger, I tried to gather online a bunch of people like me that were young that also wanted to fold. Uh, but it was much harder back then. You didn't have Discord. You didn't have uh, <laughs> social media. Social media. You couldn't really get the word out. And so I, we had a, an online little email list that uh, a group of young folders would get together and you know do a little contest, design contest or something like that mm-hmm. for a week or something like that. But it was much less organized, and you couldn't couldn't find people in the way that you can now. Now it's really neat that you have origami discords dedicated solely to design and sharing tri- tip, tips and tricks about design and every little aspect of origami. You can find a specific community online that can that you can share that you can find other people that are interested in that topic and so that's a a trend that i see the the more interconnection of the origami community i think that is a very good thing i think it's quite interconnected now yes. not sure how much more it can get interconnected i'd like to see some more works not necessarily dedicated to how to fold specific models but more books like in the vein of Origami Design Secrets, books that are taking a stance on a design technique or a a way of looking at or analyzing models, kind of the the meta aspects with respect to origami design, not just how to fold a particular model. I'd like to see more of that content being developed. The um, way people think, right? So, mm-hmm. um, like, I think Tatsuya Kotani, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's this, um, uh, I just can't remember the title. Uh, I, yeah, I, I'm not so well the title. Origamix? The... Origamix, yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, so he does this, like, puzzle things, they can uh, move around, fitting uh, common bases mm-hmm. and making uh, models out of it. Well, so yeah. uh, one of the things that I think you're going to talk to me about a little later, mm. um, I'm a little less interested in making 
specific models and diagrams for those models these days. I'm more interested in developing tools that will help people either design origami models or diagram origami models because if we can make those processes easier, then we'll have more of those things, right? More yes. people will design, more people will diagram and things like that. So the easier we can make it, the larger the community can grow. And so that's been the focus of my research recently has been in making software where you can simulate folding on a computer to kind of make diagrams and to be able to accurately represent the mm -hmm. folded state of a thing to a computer so that you can facilitate that kind of uh, interaction. So uh, what kind of advice would you give to young folders who aspire just to be like yourself? Hmm. Try to design and try to, if you're wanting to be like me, the thing that I like about origami is designing and creating something new via origami. And so if you're not a designer and you want to be a designer, the best advice I can give you is try, fail, and do better, right? Improve on each one of those failures. So that's the best advice I have from a designer. If you're already a designer and you want to be like me, one of the biggest driving forces behind my origami design process is to try to simplify as much as possible. Even if you're tackling a very complex design subject, try to find the simplest, elegant, most elegant crease pattern that you can that can achieve that that level of complex. Okay. I'm uh, not sure if that answers your question, but... Yes, yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> so if you were to start your origami journey in today's era with all the resources available, yeah. uh, how would you engage origami as compared to the past? You know, there are so many resources available to me now. Uh, I, I liked kind of the personal journey of exploration of my the way in which I learned origami design. Mm -hmm. You tend to learn something better if you discover it for yourself than if you are taught it externally because the way in which you get there may be longer and more circuitous, but you'll really remember those lessons yes. and why you got to that place and things like that. Whereas if you just have someone tell you this is the way that you should be doing it, then you'll be seeing all the well, in the lessons. There are <laughs> situations where that's not the right mm -hmm. thing to do. So knowing the reasons why and, and those kinds of things I, I think are useful. And so no amount of you know, absorbing external materials can replace your actual experience of designing. And so one of the things that uh, I think uh, would have been different for me if I had access to all of these, you know, these new software, or Edita, where you can draw origami uh, crease patterns very efficiently and things like that, or the, the discords where you can share everything all the time. <laughs> I think it would have changed my focus. These days, everything is very fast, and uh, I don't know whether I would have been able to slow down enough to be able to reflect and, and, and contemplate some of these things on my own. I think I would have probably relied a little bit more on the community and those resources in trying to figure out those things on my own. So I'm not, I'm not saying it's not a good world we live in right now, because certainly I probably would have progressed faster in my uh, origami design and my origami learning uh, in a time when I had more time on my hands, right? Yeah. These days, <laughs> when I learn more about these new techniques, I have an academic interest in them, in that uh, you know I'm interested in kind of the theory behind origami design, and I read a lot about them, but I don't really have the time to put those things into practice and make new origami mm -hmm. models all the time. And so, had I been exposed to some of those things earlier, uh, it certainly would have changed the models that I ended up making in the future. Do you consider your job uh, a dream job, especially when you can think of and for origami, the name of research? Yeah, so I, I really like my job. Uh, one of the things that I had at MIT and here at NUS, I'm in an educator track position, which is an academic position where your focus is on the teaching, and you have less responsibilities in the area of research. And that's not to say that I don't enjoy doing research. I really like doing research, and I really like writing papers and discovering new things. What I don't like about kind of more research, tenure-track kind of positions 
is the kind of burdens you have, the ways in which you're evaluated. I, I think I'm a pretty good cheat teacher and I like doing that as a job because I feel like I can always deliver on that and it's based on work that I'm producing and I can feel good about that. Whereas a lot of times in academia, in research positions, a lot of times you're judged not necessarily by how good your research is, but by how much money you're able to convince <laughs> other people to give you, which may have absolutely nothing to do with how good you are, or convincing people that what you're working on is publishable when certain venues may have other reasons for taking your paper or not, right? And that kind of stress about a tenure-track position, I, I didn't want as much, right? A lot of the professors that I saw at MIT, for example, right? were more concentrated on fundraising and selling their research, and they didn't have a lot of time to actually do the research. They would rely on their postdocs and the team. By their team to do the research. They still direct the research and they know what's going on, but yeah, I kind of want to do that research. That's the stuff that I like. And I don't really want to do a lot of fundraising and cheerleading and <laughs> selling. Usually a lot of what like grant proposals are is you're telling people, that I promised to do this thing that I already know how to do, <laughs> to get to some place that we won't get in 30 years, to do work that is somewhere in between, but I can't guarantee that I can do it. That's the nature of research. So I'm not really going to put that in my grant because I don't want to promise something that I, I can't give, right? And that kind of salesmanship, that storytelling of, it seems like there's a lot of backflips that you're doing that aren't in furtherance of your research, right? It's you're telling a story to get funding to do the research that you want to do. And if you didn't spend all your time doing that, you could do a lot more of the research. And so that was a frustrating thing for me. I'm much happier in an academic position that is a teaching only education kind of thing where I'm evaluating it on my teaching because I feel like that's something I can deliver and it's less stressful. Now, the fact that the research that I'm doing is a dream for me because I get to still interact with Oregon on a daily basis. Yeah, I think it's great. This is perfect for me. Uh, so good to hear that. It's not necessarily good for other people, but uh, you know, I, I love it. It's very happy for you. <laughs> How is it like to write papers with uh, the big names in origami algorithms yeah. like Lang, Hao, Hachi, Muitaran, Ergimi? A lot of people in the academic origami community, computational origami, um, mechanical structures, uh, folding structures, that kind of community. Uh, I love the community a lot because there's not a lot of competition between the people. People aren't trying to be very protective of the things that they are doing. It's not like some of these kind of cutthroat competitive cultures. It's more about can we get together? Can we talk about interesting problems? Can we solve them together? Right? And be generous with giving people credit for their contributions. Mm -hmm. It's a very, it's a really welcoming community and it's a really healthy and nice field to do research in because everybody is really kind and, and, and wants to just learn new things. And so working with all of those people, they're just very kind people. And I've learned how to be a better researcher from them. I've learned so much about origami mathematics and computation and all these kinds of things that I wouldn't have otherwise. And so I don't, I don't want to single any one of them out. Of course, Eric Domain, he was on the PhD thesis committee uh, and was my mentor for a very long time, still is. And so I, but maybe I'll, I'll give him a special shout out, but uh, really everybody in the academic origami community is super kind and nice and I, I really enjoy writing papers with them doing work with them. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. Like, like this, this is the part of science that, you know, or, or research that no one actually talks about, right? mm -hmm. because in, in my day, we also deal with research. Yeah. But yeah. it's a different kind of thing, right? Yeah, a lot of research that gets funded, mm -hmm. right, is about, since a lot of times money is on the line, it's very competitive, and you have to publish before someone else, and they could scoop you or steal or these kinds of things, and can become very negative very quickly. Yes, yes. And what I like about the, no one's throwing money at origami. <laughs> I mean, some people are. Like, there are some applications. Yes, where yeah. that, because, but I am an academic. I like solving problems because I think they are interesting and cool problems to solve. 
I'm not doing it for the money or the salesmanship or things like that. Absolutely. And so finding other academics that mm-hmm. just like to solve problems like me, I think is, is more healthy and the kind of research I want to do. And it's not to say that we aren't competitive, mm-hmm. but I think we're competitive in a healthy way, right? It's a competitive way in which if the other person wins, you're also really happy. Because now we know more about the subject. They got there first, but now I can learn from that. I can grow from it. So it's not a negative competition. Yeah. How do you get your research inspiration, especially when it talks a lot about unfolding rules, abstract molecules, you know, behavior mm-hmm. of materials? Most of the problems that I am doing in research now are to uh, enable tools that I would like to use. It may be abstract, uh, but like, for instance, when I'm designing an origami model, one of the first theoretical origami results that I came up with was if if I have part of a crease pattern that I'm working on, that I, I kind of know everything that's gonna surround it, but I don't know how to make all of the creases fit together, is it possible to do? And if it is possible to do, how can I generate what the creases are that's supposed to kind of fill in that hole in in the crease pattern. And I developed an algorithm to do that, mostly because I was interested in solving that problem for my own origami design. There isn't good software really out. I I have an implementation of that, but it doesn't have very good user interface. It's not something that people can readily use. The concepts behind that result I use almost all the time when I'm designing more because I kind of the confidence you get to say if I know that I can make the things around this flat there should be a nice set of creases in the middle of this that can resolve itself just having that confidence means I'm able to find that solution a little bit faster than maybe other people and it's a it's a really nice concept to be able to pull out in the same way that I don't use tree maker but I use the concepts of tree theory all the time and so this is just it was another tool in my toolbox and so while it seems maybe abstract to someone reading the paper the origami results that i use allow me to know a little bit more about my medium so that i can design better now some of the theoretical results like flat folding or rigid folding or simple folding or these kinds of things are computationally difficult right are 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 hard for a computer to solve don't really help me design origami, <laughs> but do help me design software that could potentially help people design origami. So it's most of the stuff that I'm interested in working on these days seem like they're abstract, but they're always the goal to allow people to make and design origami easier. So that's my motivation. Yeah, so while reading through all your papers, I realize it's very similar layout like Twist tower and translation. You consider your work in like, like So I that. actually, uh, so I know of the book, uh, you know, Lang's book on twist tiling and tessellations, and I know a lot of the results in those books. But I actually don't own a copy of that book, so I can't speak directly to how my papers correspond with that book. Certainly, there's a lot of interesting mathematics yes, in that yes. book, and I, I like to think that some of my work is also interesting mathematics. And in that way, I think they are, they are extensions of a larger world of origami mathematics, right? And so I hope the, the work that I'm producing in my papers do a little to contribute, to expand that, that area, that body of knowledge. Do you consider like compiling them all and studying? Robert Lang's good at having the discipline to be able to do that. <laughs> uh, I generate a lot of content, probably enough to make a book, right? Like, uh, mm-hmm. like all the diagrams, right? You've yes. seen, I've put together this little draft of a, a, a book of just printing out all the PDFs of various diagrams that I've made. And they're, they're a book this thick, so you know, it's, it's quite a lot of material, but there's a lot of additional work to be able to compile that into a book. And it's not just the design, it's the things that are fun for me are the design work and even to some extent diagramming. I enjoy diagramming, but doing all that extra, it seems like there's not that much extra work to do. Mm-hmm. But I just haven't haven't done that work. On the research side, I don't see a lot of value in putting them all together in a book at the moment because there's not a cohesive story to tell linking them all together. And people can find that material freely available on my website. So Mm -hmm. there's no real reason to put them in book form in the way that, you know, Robert has a number of 
nice books that are a, a continuous thought, right? Like origami d design secrets are building off of tree theory and different facets of it uh, in a very well organized way. Twist tiling and tessellations is really, from my understanding, is talking a lot about the mathematics he developed in writing a mathematical library for for make designing crease patterns for these tessellating and tiling yes. objects. And so it uh, it all tells a good story, right? It fits together in a book. A lot of the work that I do, there's not quite enough yet there mm -hmm. to tell a comprehensive story on one particular topic. There's probably enough there to tell lots of little stories about yes. little <laughs> topics, but don't really feel like putting that to a book. Now for for diagramming models and things like that, I enjoy having my models in convention books and things like that. You know, if, if Origami House came to me and said, Jason, you want to write a book? Usually what they do is you have to have a good body of diagrams already, which I do, but then you also usually have to have a few flagship models that are previously undiagrammed that can stand out as original things for that publication. And I just don't make models like that anymore. Probably it's not in my future to do an origami house book, but making a book sometime in the future is, isn't out of the question. I just take some time to do that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Recently, your project portfolio has passed the one year mark. Congratulations on yeah. successfully posting every day uh, for that duration. Could you tell me the motivation, the objective, and the direction behind Flat Folder? Yeah, Flat Folder is a software that allows you to input a representation of a flat foldable crease pattern that usually has mountain valleys assigned, but they don't necessarily need to be assigned for flat folded to work. What it'll do is try to fold that crease pattern to make a flat folded state. Basically, fold along all the creases and tries to find a, a layering of all of those faces so that the paper isn't intersecting itself. And that's not always possible. Not every crease pattern is flat foldable. And actually to decide whether a crease pattern is flat foldable is uh, actually a problem that is commonly thought of as intractable, uh, computationally intractable. In, in a class of problems, we like to call uh, NP hard. Uh, so basically, if we had a computer running for the rest of my lifetime, even the fastest computer in the world, even for relatively small crease patterns, it's possible to have such crease patterns that we can't find the answer to using a computer. That's like provable, assuming some strong assumptions. Now, what Flat Folder does is recognizes the fact that most models, most crease patterns that humans generate are not in this kind of bad class of crease patterns that are theoretically difficult to fold or difficult to compute whether they can be folded. And so what it tries to do is solve the crease pattern in a way that can, can kind of decompose it into its simplest elements, areas of the crease pattern that can be folded independently from one another, recognize when there's that independence and be able to solve these smaller problems faster than you would otherwise if you were to consider all of the possibilities like the solver in Oripa or Oriadita do. They have to do this exponential search all the time. Whereas what Flat Folder will do is, well, let's look at our problem, our crease pattern, try to break it down into smaller problems first, and then solve those smaller problems with an exponential search. So basically, <laughs> that's a long-winded answer to say that Flat Folder mm -hmm. will take in a crease pattern and try to spit out all of the possible ways you could fold this. It, it's able to compute all of those things relatively quickly for most crease patterns that you give it, even very complex ones. So that's nice. The other nice thing about finding all of the solutions is that, for example, um, color change model. There can be many ways of folding color change crease patterns, but if there's a billion different ways to fold it, and you put it into Oriadita, and it's trying to, it's very unlikely that the first one that comes up with as a solution is the one that you were looking for, right? As a designer, right? Because the thing that has the right color change pattern that you're looking for is maybe three of those billion states and finding which one of those is, is very difficult to do. But Flat Folder is able to decompose that into its independent 
Mm. Uh, like if I have a flap on this side of the crease pattern that can either be here or here, I can make that choice independently of everything else and the way in which flat folder breaks that down allows you to pick through those states much easier so you can find the one that you're looking for. So those are the main motivation behind flat folders so that I can see all the different states. Now the real motivation behind flat folder is that if I can generate flat folded states and I can find all of the states, then I can use that to simulate flat folding of origami in a way that's more sophisticated than most origami simulators, flat folding kind of diagramming software. The basic ones are, are very limited in what you're allowed to do with the paper. Most of them will say, you'll put an infinite line over your flat folding and say everything on one side of the line folded on top of everything to the left of the line. And that's like pure land folding and it's very restricted type of folding. Most things you can't fold because the software is not able to represent the complexity of what you might have with a, a very complex folded state. Right? It's not storing all of that information in a way that you can manipulate. And so if you can store the information about the flat folded state in a common way, in a way that can be interchanged between origami software, then you can really start to do more sophisticated operations on that. And that leads to, I think, your next question, which is about um, a new software yes. that I'm working on, <laughs> which is actually doing that. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's got flat folder running in the background to solve states, but basically what it'll do is if I want to fold a more complicated fold, not just a valley fold on top of everything, but a reverse fold or a sink or a closed sink or a clopen sink or all these kinds of different things, then I can do that by moving everything on this side of the line over to the other side of the line and then showing me all the different possible layer orders. I can rearrange those things in. This is line folder, This right? is line folder. Mm -hmm. Now, the interface there is not very good. I, haven't, I, I just had a, a couple weeks to work on it this summer, so it's in a place where uh, it can do some simple things, but uh, it doesn't have the nice interface stuff that you'd want. But hopefully this winter I'll be able to be able to differentiate for the user between the output states, things like valley folds, mountain folds, uh, reverse folds, outside reverse folds, sinks, and open and closed sinks, and things like that, to make it a little bit more usable, because right now it's it's actually not so easy. <laughs> but the, uh, I, the goal is to make a software you, where you can fold most flat foldable models mm -hmm. in the software. That That's the hope. So you can do all those. Uh, and then hopefully generate diagrams from it. So I suppose that this is your current goal in your origami discipline. Mm -hmm. So what is your next goal? I kind of think that this is my next goal because right, it's not at a... Uh, the, the line folder right now is not in a place that's actually usable by people. And there's a lot of interesting research questions that need to be solved in order for that to be a successful project. So uh, a lot of the future goals around that project involve how do you differentiate output states as being differentiating between uh, inside reverse fold and outside reverse fold, a sink fold, a uh, closed sink fold, uh, these kinds of things. How do you differentiate between these types of folds computationally? Right? How do you identify that, that generate all of the inside reverse folds that are possible from this state, for example? Or once I have a flat folded state, right now flat folder and line folder and things like that, they will represent it mathematically perfectly. When we have multiple points mathematically, they should be at the same location. In origami diagrams that you'll often see, the, those layers are actually separated from each other visually so that you can see some indication of the layers mm -hmm. going behind. What's the what's an automatic way that you can offset layers so you get that offset layer style, but you don't have to do that process manually, right? Those kinds of things are active areas of research that I don't have an answer for. Uh, it's not something that I'm currently working on, but would be a problem that needs to be solved in order to make this software usable for automatic diagramming. Then there's other, you know, ideally, you'd also have an algorithm for taking a look at a crease pattern and being able to decompose it into the step-by-step -step mm. diagrams wow. that you and I are used to following, right? 
And there is some initial work in this area. Uh, I think Hugo Akitaya uh, had a paper on this in maybe six Osmi or five Osmi, something like that, of working toward being able to break down a crease pattern and un basically kind of unfold a crease pattern using some of these elemental steps, but certainly not really usable at this stage. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to make that kind of process uh, a reality. So those are some future directions that I, I could go. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But they're all in service of this kind of, can I make an automatic origami diagram? Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, it's, it's, it's still very <laughs> further, way further down the road, okay? So as a startup of the origami convention mm -hmm. and MIT student then, I believe you can give valuable insights to the newly formed student club origami mm -hmm. at US. Yes. How did you start the origami convention? So uh, uh, when I got to MIT, actually, the origami club at MIT already existed. It had existed for a while. Various students and alumni had been involved with it, but usually they meant maybe a few times a year. It was pretty casual. You got together, you showed yeah. some stuff, but you know, it wasn't really uh, it's very informal. Uh, very very informal. Yeah. Over the course of my tenure as president of Origamet and then as their an advisor to it, basically I got them to a point where before it was like maybe one or two people that were interested in origami. Now it's a group that meets usually every week during the term. They've got a student structure of officers that kind of is is able to perpetuate itself, right? They have a way of transitioning those responsibilities. We have a, a number of people there now that are uh, are very passionate about origami. I think one of the current presidents is uh, uh, Brandon Wong, who I think uh, you're familiar with from the Discord. But I, that took a lot of work to kind of get there. The nice thing about NUS here at NUS is that I have access to, I don't know, probably like 10 times as many undergraduate students as I did at MIT. MIT has about 5,000 undergraduate students, which is actually not a lot. And it was always difficult to find officers and people among our student groups because the amount of people that are interested in origami is actually a fairly small percentage of any particular population. So maybe we could get 10 or 20 people of 5,000 interested, right? It's like less than 1%. But at NUS, I think we have many more than 5,000 undergraduate students. <laughs> and so actually they didn't have very much trouble to find, mm -hmm. I think the minimum was 20 when they started to be involved. To fill the leadership roles, right? And to fill yeah. all those leadership roles. And NUS has a lot more demands on what <laughs> positions and structure you need to have for a student organization. And so they filled those roles pretty uh, quickly. Uh, and now it's, it's accelerating much faster than than origami <laughs> did. And so I'm excited to see where they're going with it. I don't have necessarily any tips for them. I think they're doing a great job as they are right now. If they want to expand into doing like a annual convention or things like that, I can provide guidance to them, but I'm not gonna be the catalyst in making some of those things happen because I want it to come from the students. I don't wanna be telling them things to be yeah. doing. It needs they to come from the Exactly. Yeah, so. Uh, but I think they're doing a great job so far. They've had a few events, they've had a few meetings. Uh, I think they're doing good. Good to hear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So talking about conventions, I recall you mentioned you meet, met Akira Yoshizawa. Mm -hmm. How was yeah. that experience like? It was not uh, an experience that I was really able to fully appreciate at the time. I think I was, oh, man, I don't remember, probably 10 or something like that. I was quite young. I'm not sure, it was somewhat, it was within a couple of years of that. But I was young. I was not in high school yet. I was just an energetic little kid and uh, I got to show him some of the models that I made and say hi to him. But it was not in any more of a way than, than like a fan meeting someone. So I didn't get to like sit down and have a conversation with him. Since yeah. then, since he's passed, uh, I've met his wife numerous times in Japan. I've, you know, been able to be fortunate enough to go to a number of his exhibits of his work uh, in Japan and other places. Mm -hmm. Well, I can say that I've met Kiri Yoshizawa. Uh, I, I feel like I've learned more from him through his work than through that experience. But it was, 
it's nice to be able to say that yes. I met the master. Or uh, probably more influential to me at that convention was to meet, maybe it was that convention or one of the later ones, Eric Schwazel. It, it was just really neat to see how he thought about things. I think I probably met him. I took a class with him. It, it wasn't just like meeting him in passing mm-hmm. like I did with uh, Yoshizawa. Uh, I actually got to take a class of him teaching his rat, one of his most iconic models for me. It was a model that I had already memorized. I knew uh, and folded many times, but I had folded it from diagrams. And I'm not even sure if he was the one that diagrammed them or not, but you know, I learned to fold it in a certain way. And when I got to the class, I was folding along with him, but I was kind of like, yeah, I, I, was, I was pretty cool. I, I knew <laughs> what's going on already. Right. Yeah. But he corrected me in a number of places where his guidance in how he might fold the model was quite a bit different from, from the diagrams and didn't really come through the, a lot of the shaping, those kinds of things. Uh, his perspective on wet folding versus folding from foil paper. When I was growing up, I didn't have a lot of handmade papers. I didn't wet fold. I didn't use MC. I didn't know what MC was back then. I folded from foil a lot. As a kid, you like the shiny thing, so you make the shiny models. But one of the things that I learned in that class and that I carried with me to this day, whenever I fold foil paper, he hated the <laughs> look of metal because it doesn't feel like paper, right? It doesn't have that look. It doesn't have that shaping, that feel. and. He would say that whenever he folds from foil, it's fine to fold from foil because you're trying to save time and things like that. But he would always have the, the paper side, the white side of the foil, on the outside because he, he's not using the metal for its look. He's using it for its shaping purposes, almost exclusively. And, and for a while there, when I was designing origami models, I was exclusively folding from foil, Japanese foil. From then on, always fold with the white color on the outside. And you can actually see that in a lot of my early origami designs because that's what Eric Schwarzel did. <laughs> and, and I want to... That's the vice right now. Yeah. And I, I, I think I agree with him now, looking back on it, that, that it looks better. It looks more like origami. It looks cleaner if, if you see the, the paper side of the model. Yeah, but I would never have uh, expected that he, as a previous... Uh, Metal sculptor, right? Mm-hmm. He would say that he does like the, 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 the look of metal he was a, for he, a model. He sculpted mm-hmm. many elements mm-hmm. in many medium. I think he, he did lots of different types of sculpture. But I think when he found paper, uh, I mean, he can speak for himself on this, but the way in which the paper naturally conforms to kind of these, these surfaces that, that have this constraint of always having 360 degrees of paper at every point, is what in mathematics we call a, a developable surface is something that could be formed from a, a, a sheet of paper, not something that's like a, a sphere, which is doubly curved, has less than 180 degrees of paper in, in each place, or a saddle surface like a, like a horse's saddle, where it has actually more than 180 degrees at any point. A developable surface like paper has this quality of balance, uh, having just the right amount of material at each point. Uh, and and that the, the forms that's created from a developable surface used a lot in architecture and, and design because it has this certain feel. And I think for him, when he wanted to make things from paper, he wanted to get that, that quality of it. And he wanted to make sure that the audience, the observer of his work, knew that they were looking at paper, right? And so mm-hmm. to have them look at metal, there's something that looks less impressive. That this, oh, sure, this is just a sculpture. Mm-hmm. Uh, doesn't have this constraint that it was formed from a sheet. But when you see the paper, what you're familiar with with paper is that it's an uncut mm-hmm. thing. And that, in a sense, seems more impressive. Now, I, I'm putting words in his mouth, but uh, <laughs> but I think that at least that's what I learned from him. Yeah, which of your origami designs are you proudest of? Generally, it's the most recent one I designed. Uh, that's that's how a lot of the strikes. No, um, the... ju- so just generally as a designer, the longer you've been with a design, the more flaws and the more ways you feel like you mm-hmm. could have done better. Uh, in a design. And so usually the most proud I am of a design 
is right after I finish designing. <laughs> oh, yeah, right? I and then I start to see the flaws. And so one of the, th- oh, uh, actually this uh, NUS origami logo, uh, it was the most recent thing I designed, a two sheet model uh, that's actually uh, quite easy. Mm-hmm. No, it's not glued. Uh, it's just um, the oh, way in oh, which it's uh, put together makes it a very strong connection. And I like the simplicity of that model and kind of the economy with trying to make something very simple match uh, a particular logo or design. I kind of like those kinds of challenges. But probably the, the thing that I'm most proud of designing since coming to Singapore was this 8x8 color change mm-hmm. checkerboard. Yeah. For a long time, it was thought that that you couldn't make a... 8x8 eight eight color change checkerboard from a square grid that was smaller than 32 by 32 because essentially if you map the perimeter of the square to all of the edges of color change that exists on on that 8x8 eight eight checkerboard there's kind of a constraint there. there there's an equality there not not exact equality i think but but a correspondence there that usually when you make a color change model you're having to go through the perimeter of the paper in some way. And so a lot of color change models are designed by mapping the perimeter of the page of the square of paper to the areas that you want to color change and then working out the rest of the mm-hmm. middle. It's possible to generate color change without doing that by having flaps of paper come from the interior of the model that can kind of lay over some of the perimeter of the paper so you can potentially do better. And that's the concept anyway. How you could actually do that to gain efficiency on an 8x8 checkerboard, people hadn't done yet. But I saw some people online trying to push this boundary. Instead of being 32 by 32, maybe they tried to get 31 by 31 or 30 by 30. And uh, I don't remember what the exact proportions were, but I saw some of that and been like, this sounds like a really fun design challenge. And so. I spent an, a couple days just focusing on nothing but this problem and was able to get it down to a 26 by 26 uh, square, mm. which I think using this technique is about as good as you can get. I'm almost positive it's not optimal, but it's it's pretty close to what I think is, is what's achievable. And so I'm pretty proud of kind of beating this bound that people thought was the limit for, for a very long time. It's not a particularly nice model to fold. It's very <laughs> thick in a lot of places, and but it is at least mathematically precise mm-hmm. in, in forming that color change pattern. Uh, and it has some interesting, it, it, it doesn't, it looks like a box pleated model for most parts, but a lot of the parts are, deviate from box pleating quite a bit in some kind of interesting ways. So. Uh, that's that's probably the one that I'm most proudest of since coming to Singapore. So, uh, what were your proudest moments uh, in your origami journey? In my origami journey, probably that that first starting to try to design mm-hmm. origami was mm-hmm. the most difficult because I had zero confidence. I felt like I had zero ability. I mean, I had some technical ability. I could fold, but I had no experience in design, and so that was probably the most frustrating place for me. Of course. There's another hurdle, similar kind of hurdle, when I was doing my PhD and I'm working on all these folding related problems. I'm coming from the mechanical engineering department, but a lot of the folding problems that I was working on kind of required more mathematics and computer science background. And there was a point in in working on those problems where I felt like I was an outsider. I felt like I was an imposter (laughs) working on problems that I had no business of working on and how am I going to contribute when all these people are light years ahead of me. But I worked at it and I tried to learn the things that I didn't know because I wanted to solve these problems. And a lot of times if if you have the drive to, to do that, you know, I picked up an undergraduate education in computer science and like a year and eventually got to the point where I was teaching an algorithms class at MIT for for three years. I know a lot more about that subject now after I taught it for three years than I did at the start. That that was a difficult period for me in in, in graduate school because I didn't fe- I, I felt like I I wasn't good enough. And at the time I wasn't. Everyone can grow and learn those things that they don't know, and you'll get better. For me, that those were hard moments, but I grew from them, and so I look back on them fondly, I guess. 
very inspiring. <laughs> yeah, they know that part about you. So yeah, lastly, how would you like to be remembered? How would I like to mm. be remembered? Uh, well, I don't, mm. I don't feel like I'm going anywhere anytime soon. That that question feels like, uh, you know, I, like people <laughs> to know, to know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I would like to. <laughs> I, no, well, no, no, no. I mean, mm. I, I want when people think of me as a as a in the origami community. Mm. Uh, of course, people mostly know me as a as an origami designer, as a folder. They know some of the works that I've folded. While I'm very proud of the things that I've learned to design and fold, the, the things that I'm most proud of in my contributions to the origami community are my work in trying to bring people together and, and fold via the events we put on through Origami USA, through the communities I've developed at MIT and here at NUS, uh, communities of folders that are uh, spreading origami, the software that I'm making that will hopefully enable more people to uh, des design and, and engage with origami, the research that I do in, in, in making those things, those are more of the things that I'm uh, these days I'm more proud of and probably why I'm spending more of my time on those than, than designing origami. Pretty, uh, a lot of people these days, with all the resources that are available to them, can design really amazing origami models. And I've been astounded by, you know, the starboards that are on the you know, yes, Discord, yes, right? Yes. Of just jaw-dropping models that are being designed every day on, by these young and old and just everybody in between this large origami community that we have now. So other people can do that now. And so what I want to do is concentrate my efforts on things that maybe other people aren't able or willing to do, try to make my impact there. So that's how I want to be remembered in the York. <laughs> okay, yeah, and with that, we conclude the interview. Okay. Thank okay. you, Jason, once again for Thank sharing. Thank you, that. everyone. This is uh, <laughs> lots of fun. Yeah, letting the viewers, your fans, pick your brains a little bit, get to know you a lot better. I know you a lot better now. <laughs> <laughs> All the best in your career in NUS and also your projects. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you. And thanks once again. You come to the end of the video. Um, also, a, a big shout out to Ivan over there. Thanks, Ivan. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> it's a our well, cameraman and director. Yeah, you saw me. Same assistant. So, all of our socials will be in the description below. Yeah, do uh, like, subscribe, share, and comment, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye. Bye.